大家好，我叫罗朗，我是一个独一无二、最热爱传统中餐的老外。Okay, that's that's all I'll say. So if any of you find that a bit strange, you're not alone. I get that all the time. You've probably noticed at this point that I'm not actually Chinese, so there's that. I'd like to share a little bit about my philosophy about food. And what really brought me、uh, to China, and what I've discovered over the past few years, that has given me kind of a unique perspective about food and culture. I started working in a Chinese restaurant at 15 years old in the United States, and I developed a really a passion for Chinese food. My first passion actually wasn't food, though, wasn't cooking. It was art. And the thing about art that captivated me was the ability for Artist to take a basic human emotion, an idea, a fear, or a question, and put it in a context through a medium that everybody could relate to, everybody could understand. And I realized that food was very similar in its ability to do just that—to bring people together, to connect us through something that we all share, but also to explore bigger life questions: Why are we here? What's the purpose of life? And how can we better connect with each other and share these things which make us most human? And a question that's come up for me again and again throughout my life is about authenticity. What does it mean to be authentic? What does it mean to live authentically? What makes a dish authentic? So again, my journey starts here. Fifteen years old at a Chinese restaurant named Formosa. I can still remember the first night that I was working at Formosa, and The sounds, the smells, the language—everything was unfamiliar to me. But the owners, Andy and Lily, they took me in. They kind of made me feel welcome, like one of their own. Andy even gave me a Chinese name, Fei Jai. <laughs> and I was really excited when he told me, "Your name—we're going to call you Fei Jai from now on." If I would get a compliment from a customer, or a tip, or the register wasn't missing any money, he'd say, "Great job, Fei Jai. Nice going, Fei Jai." I even started calling myself by that name. He would say, "Michael, really, you did a good job." I know, I know, because I'm Fei Jai, right? He said, "Oh yeah, you are the most Fei Jai of all the Fei Jai." <laughs> Eventually, I think Andy's wife Lily, her conscience got the best of her. She pulled me aside and said, "Hey, Michael, I got to tell you, Fei Jai actually means fat boy." So that was the last time I started calling myself by that name. Andy wasn't all about joking and you know teasing me, but he was also kind of a mentor, a big brother. And my first experience cooking Chinese food on a Chinese walk was at Formosa in the kitchen. And I would ask him, Andy, what is the secret to this particular dish, or how do you how do you get it to taste like that? What are you doing in the walk? Is there a technique or something? And he'd say, That's the Chinese food secret. Are you Chinese? We all knew the answer to that one. But over the next four years or so, I developed a real passion for Chinese cuisine. And four years later, I ended up here in China. 1998. I had just graduated from high school, and I got a scholarship to Shanghai Shifan Dashia, Shanghai Teachers University. And I saw a totally different side of Chinese food and culture than I had ever experienced before.、Um, I still remember writing my parents a letter about jianbing, you tiao jianbing. I was like, "This is the most amazing thing I've ever tried. You guys have got to experience this." And then there was, of course, the soup dumplings xiao long bao, which I absolutely love. This particular photo was taken after a rather gluttonous lunch of more xiao long bao than I can even remember.、Um, but I loved them. I loved everything about it. I loved the food. There was something very real and raw and authentic about what I was experiencing. I couldn't put it into context, but it really hit me on a deep level. So a few years later, I was back and forth between China and the United States, and I finished college. And I had this dream. I wanted to open the world's best, most authentic Chinese restaurant. I wanted to bring all of these foods that I had grown up with in the United States, at Formosa, in Shanghai. I wanted to share these amazing things with the rest of the world. So in 2003, I enrolled in culinary school in New York City, just a few blocks away from Chinatown. And for those of you who know, obviously,、uh, the food business, the chef life, it's very intense. It's competitive. It's exhausting. It's frustrating. It's wonderful. It's even cutthroat. All the students in the school were the same. 
During the day, we would take class with the chef instructors here. This instructor, Sixto, was one of my, my big influences early on. And on the weekends, during the evenings, we would be staging in restaurants in New York City. We didn't get paid, but we were all in competition for the best internship we could get. A Michelin-starred restaurant, a celebrity chef, uh, a place where we would become famous or we could learn something that we could then go on to open our own restaurant and become famous. It was all about awards and competition and being the best. I did this for a few months, and I really got a lot out of it. I learned a tremendous amount. I grew as a chef, but I felt like this wasn't the food I wanted to cook. This wasn't really where my heart was. So despite, you know, the disbelief from my classmates, my chef instructors, I decided to go to Chinatown and get an internship in a Chinese restaurant. And I must have knocked on every door in Chinatown asking, can I come in and work for free? You don't have to pay me. I'll sweep, I'll chop, I'll cook, I'll do whatever you want, but I want to learn Chinese food. Pretty much everybody said no right away. No, no thanks. But there was one chef um, who owned a Shanghainese restaurant, as it was, on Bayard Street in Lower Manhattan, and she allowed me to come into this restaurant you see here. This is Chef Zhu, the pastry chef at the Moon House restaurant. She taught me a tremendous amount, and my goal was to make the perfect xiaolongbao. That was my goal. If I can make the perfect xiaolongbao, I've made it. I've, I've reached my goal. For any of those of you who know, those things are not easy to make, very difficult to make. And one day, I'd taken a break. I was really frustrated. I wasn't getting it. They weren't turning out nice. The shape was strange. They, they looked like anything but a traditional soup dumpling. I walked out of the pastry kitchen into the main kitchen. Chef Bu, the executive chef, he was sauteing on his walk. And I said, God, you know, why is this so hard? How can it be so difficult just to make a dumpling? He said, hey, kid. Yes, yeah, chef. You know why you're not getting it? No, tell me. Because you're not Chinese. <laughs> he was serious. You don't have roots in this cuisine. These ingredients, these aren't your ingredients. This isn't your food. This isn't your culture. You don't understand the philosophy, the spirit behind the dishes that you're trying to make. You may get good at it, but it's never going to be yours. It's never going to belong to you because you don't have the roots. Of course, I wasn't happy about that, but I understood what he was saying, and he was right in a way, that I needed more. I wanted to go back to China again. This was like my fifth trip, and I wanted to get roots. I wanted to establish something deep and personal that made that food mine, that I would get acknowledgement, recognition, and acceptance from the chefs and the restaurants and Andy and Chef Bu and all the people who said I couldn't do it. So in 2009, I moved back to Beijing. I started working with this chef, Zhang Fengling. She's one of China's most famous pastry chefs. She's a master Chinese pastry chef. And I had registered to take the Gaoji Mian Dian Shi, the uh, advanced Chinese pastry certification given by the Chinese government. There's only been a handful of foreigners, I think, ever to take the exam. I passed on the second time. It was all in Chinese, though, to my credit. Um, but I remember the day that we started going through the curriculum, we reached the xiaolongbao, the soup dumpling portion of the curriculum, and I said, okay, I got this. I kneaded my dough, I mixed the meat, I started folding them right away, and she said, 大家过来看一下, He's the only foreigner in the school, the only foreign chef ever to come to the school, and his soup dumplings look way better than yours, and you're all Chinese, shame on you, shame. So I started thinking to myself, okay, eventually the rest of my classmates, they're going to catch up. The only thing that really separates us is practice time. And if they put in the practice, eventually they're all going to get good at it, at least as good as I was. And that bothered me. I felt like, what makes this mine? If I make a soup dumpling that's great, that's wonderful, but what makes it authentic? How do I connect with it? How do I share with people an idea, a story, how do I connect through this? If it's something that everyone else has learned, we all have the same recipe, we had the same teacher. And I realized I wasn't going to get what I was looking for in a school, from a book, from an individual teacher, in a city with traffic jams and Starbucks lattes. I needed to go out there. I needed to, to expand and travel. I wanted to feel like I had a personal connection to everything that I was cooking, everything that I was doing. I needed to go out. So in 2010, 
my best friend and I, we set out on the road, we got bicycles, and I bought a tent and a sleeping bag, and I decided I was going to travel throughout China. I was going to go further than the other chefs had gone, more remote, more authentic, more obscure, and I spent a little over a year on the road doing that. I had some ex experiences that were incredible, things that will stay with me the rest of my life. You know, milking yaks in Qinghai, making nang in Xinjiang, nai doufu in Neimeng, uh, grinding uh, huang mi in Shanxi, farming in Guizhou, really incredible experiences. But the most common response I got from people, I would see something interesting, you know, somebody was making noodles on the side of the road or, or making dou pi fu zhu, something like that, and I would get off my bike with my camera and say, hey, what are you doing? What is that? And they were curious too, they would say, where, where are you from? I'm American. What do you do? Well, I don't do anything right now. I'm, I'm traveling, I'm a chef, you know, I'm, I'm researching Chinese cuisine. What about your wife and kids? How old are you? I'm 31, never been married, no kids. Do you have a house? No, no car, no house, no money. Are, are you okay? <laughs> are you sure this is, it's nothing wrong with you? And I understood where they were coming from. Here's this chef who comes from a developed, reasonably wealthy country, um, has all the opportunities, and he's going to the most remote places in the world to try and find this traditional, authentic food. Things that a lot of the people there didn't seem to care a lot about. They were saying, what's so interesting about that, you know? We're working hard to get a, a nicer house, a better car, more money, more opportunity, and you just want to take photos of our lunch. You know, it's a bit strange. But I also saw a lot of things that really spoke to me and I felt connected me with food I had grown up with or I had seen that I didn't think of as Chinese. You know, this, this photo here on the top left is of uh, Yumi Baba, which is typical in Sichuan, Guizhou, Yun Guizhuan, that area, uh, like corn tamales that we have in the US. Flax bread from Qinghai, uh, another dish here from Qinghai. These were all things that I felt I recognized. So I was on the road probably about six months, and I stopped in the northern Yunnan town of Zhao Tong. I was looking for directions to the western part of Guizhou, to Weining, that's famous for its traditional dry cured ham. The Huo Tui in Weining, of course, is very famous. So I saw that there were all these tables laid out on the side of the road. People were cooking like a, like a banquet. And I said, hey, can you give me directions? And I started talking with this family. It turns out that their eldest son was getting married. So I ended up staying and joining this wedding and cooking for about three or four days, hundreds of dishes for hundreds of people, maybe thousands, I don't know. Uh, it was an amazing experience. And I don't remember the particular day that something hit me, but I remember what I was doing. I was plating a dish of fried fish. We had this sauce that was made with chilies and herbs, and it was sweet and spicy and sticky, and the whole dish was, it was beautiful to look at, but it was also delicious. And I had asked one of the bridesmaids, I said, hey, can you throw me a towel? She said, what for? I said, well, I got sauce on the edge of the bowl, I want to wipe it off, and she said, well, why would you do that? I said, because I want it to look nice. She said, who cares about it looking nice? Everybody's enjoying it, they're smiling, the food is delicious, they're happy. And I was thinking to myself, when did I lose that part of me that cooked for the joy, for connecting with other people, for expressing something that was so human, a wedding, this happiness that these two people are sharing to spend the rest of their lives together? It wasn't about awards and recognition and media attention and things like that. It was about connecting with people, and I had lost that. Somewhere along the way, I had forgotten why I started. So that made a deep impression on me. Now, I wish I could say that that changed my mind and my attitude right away, but in fact, um, it took a little while. So I continued on to Western Guizhou, and I reached my friend's village, uh, and I was going to branch out from there to try and find these hams, but there was a problem. It was already the middle of winter, and it was freezing. And it was one of the deepest freezes that Western Guizhou had experienced in years. All of the roads were iced over, I ended up getting pneumonia, I was really sick, I crashed my bike a few times, and I cracked a rib on my right side. I couldn't do a whole lot else, so I just kind of wandered around the, the ganji cai shi chang, you know, the, the wet market, outdoor market, and I asked one of the guys, I said, where can I find these hams? Is there a road out of here? I don't want to be stuck. And he said, if you cross the mountain into Ina, you'll find the hams, but you also might find a road that's passable. So the next morning, I got up early. I figured, okay, I'm just going to walk across this path and get to the other side. 
Well, the road started out fairly easy to traverse, but as the day went on, it got harder and harder. And it got darker and darker, and the road was more difficult to see until I was basically climbing straight up. This is about six hours into my hike. And every time I thought I reached the top of the mountain, I was wrong. Then it was like this. I was totally lost. I ended up almost sleeping on the mountain that night. I thought, man, I, I might have died up here. What was I doing this for? So I was walking back and forth trying to find a road out. All the roads were blocked. I was asking people, do you know where I can find some ham? They, they must have thought I was crazy. You know, it's the middle of winter. You've got dirty clothes on. You've got a beard. Your hair is long. And you've got nothing with you. You're looking for ham. You know, it must, must be something wrong. But eventually I met these two guys, brothers, and they said, hey, we can take you. And eventually we made it down the other side early in the morning, and I wanted to wake up and thank them for saving me, for risking their lives, but they were gone. But I was thinking, you know, I risked my life for this, for this food, for, you know, capturing these traditional dishes that I grew up with or that I feel really connected to, for what? You know, a lot of these people don't even seem to care that much. You know, why are you interested in this? This isn't my food. Chef Boo said that, and Andy said that. These are not your dishes. You have no roots here. So who cares? So I spent another few months on the road. I finished my trip. I got to Taishan. And then I was asked by Ambassador Gary Locke to come to Beijing to be his personal chef. I grew a lot, but I still felt like I wasn't connecting with people through the food that I was cooking. I really wanted to cook Chinese food. But I traveled every chance I got. And I eventually went back to Ina in 2015, and I was crossing the mountain again, determined to find these hams, and I ran across this young man. And he said, hey, are you that chef, that guy that was lost here a couple years ago, like four years ago? I said, yeah, that, that's me. He said, I've heard of you. You're famous here. I said, really? Why? And he said, because we all thought you were insane. I asked him if he could take me around and try and show me uh, you know, where to find these hams. And it was the same thing. People looked confused. They didn't seem to believe me. They were just kind of like, you know, no, it's not bu fang bian, that kind of a thing. So eventually, you know, I was getting really frustrated, and I said, you know, this is why I gave up on the idea of putting all of this recipes and experience into a book. And he said, why would you do that? And I said, because nobody believes in it. No one seems to understand why I'm doing this. They feel like this isn't part of me. I'm not qualified. It's not authentic. I'm not... I'm not, um, I'm not a master Chinese chef. I'm not even Chinese. And he said, you know, I think you're wrong. They may not understand now, but eventually they will. If you stay at it and you don't give up, what you eventually give them, they're going to look at it and they're going to see the value. People are going to understand the message that you're trying to give them. A few months later, I resigned from my job at the uh, ambassador's residence, and I was determined to put all of these recipes and experiences into a book. And I made presentations and proposals, and I met with publishers and investors, and everybody said the same thing. Wouldn't you rather write about American food? You're American. Nobody's going to buy a book about traditional Chinese food, authentic Chinese food, written by a non-Chinese person. Start with something else. Why don't you write a book about American cuisine? So I started researching that, and I eventually wrote the book that you see there, which is Foodways. It's the history of American food and culture. I have two big takeaways from that experience. The first one is, being an American did not qualify me to write a book about American food. Just because I'm a Caucasian American, I was born in the United States, didn't make me an expert. But there was something else. I realized that a lot of the ingredients that I had seen in traditional, authentic Chinese dishes were, in fact, not from China. They didn't originate here. Corn, potatoes, chilies, wheat, sesame, all of these ingredients are not native to China. So dishes used with those ingredients, what makes them authentic? That was the question I was curious about. What I realized eventually is that the roots I was looking for in China had very little to do with who I was, where I was born, who my parents were, where I grew up. That didn't necessarily make anything authentic. What made it authentic was that part of myself I was trying to communicate. Authenticity in my mind, I realized, was not about roots that go down. It was about roots that go out, things that are personal. So this summer, I moved to Guangzhou 
to create a cultural space where I could connect with people again. I could rediscover that passion for food and share something of myself through the food that I was creating. The one thing I'd like to leave everyone with is this. Anything we do, whether it's food, painting, music, writing, any kind of art, what makes it authentic is not roots. It's not where you're from, it's not who you are. It's about courage. Now, the original meaning of the word courage is to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. Honestly, openly, vulnerably. Share with others who you are with everything that you have. These days, I'm not so concerned with Michelin stars, with awards, with press and interviews. I ask myself, am I connecting with the people that I'm serving? Are my staff happy? Do they find joy in their work? Are we doing something meaningful? And I think that if I can do that, if all of us can do that, then we're doing something really special. I believe everyone has a unique contribution to make to the world. Maybe this is mine. But we can't do it without courage. Thank you.